15, 20 minutes between an actual fault occurring and you knowing about it. The other problem is that you have to explicitly define each of the checks, which can be very tedious and very time consuming. So what this guy has done, he's actually built a plugin that uses Nagios and fixes up a lot of these problems. The first thing it fixes up is that it's a lot easier to configure because basically you just tell it, I want to monitor this host or this host name, whether it be a router or a server or whatever. It'll go there and say, okay, I found this server. I fa found this server is blah and I've got all these things configured. Do you want me to monitor these? Yes. And then it just imports all that into Nagios and then Nagios is set up to monitor everything on that port. If you go and add a new port to that router, an alert will come up in Nagia saying, I've got a new port. You go in there and you run the, it's the inventory script again, and it comes back and say, I found this new port. Do you want me to monitor it? And you say yes, and it updates Nagios, and from that point on, Nagios will monitor that new port as well. So you don't have to go and explicitly configure it. You don't have to go and do anything, really. It does most of the work for you. The other thing that it improves is that instead of you having to because it's not doing each individual check individually, it's a lot quicker. So instead of going to a host and checking, go log, instead of logging onto the host, checking that the host is pingable, that's one check. Then come back later on, log onto the host, check that the host hard disk is okay. Then later on, log into the host, check that the uh, network port is okay, et cetera, et cetera, which can obviously be quite tedious. It logs in once and runs a script, and that script outputs everything on that server that, you, it's, that it can see. That all comes back all in one go. So basically, you've got this TCP port. Whatever connects to that TCP port gets a complete report. That complete report comes back, and then the check MK scripts populates all the appropriate bits and pieces into Nagios as if they were done as individual checks. So it's a, a hell of a lot quicker response time is dramatically better and it also means that you don't get the situation where Nagios has to check an item three times before it trusts that it's actually dead. When, you can, it's, when Nagios checks, for example, checks the hard disk or whatever, that check could fail because it didn't get through to the server. And so again, it'll try again a little later, it could fail because it didn't get through the server again and then, you know, on the third time, it sort of says, well, now I know, now I really think something's wrong, so I'm going to raise an alert. Because CheckMK gets a report every time, that report is complete, and then just that little part of the check hard disk is saying error, it knows it actually got a response, and it knows that response is valid. So as soon as it gets, as soon as it sees a fault, it'll raise the alert straight away. So that's basically uh, check MK, which improves Nagios dramatically in, in terms of response time and manageability. It, uh, it, because it's, it's basically self-configuring for most of it. You can also set up in the host, you can set up your own scripts to put additional tests in, and that will come through in the same report, and check MK will take that additional information and display it. And those, those uh, checks that you do can be whatever you choose to do. All it's got to do is output to the print statement, basically, uh, to say OK or not OK, critical, warning, whatever, and whatever text you want to put after it. And that comes through to the Check MK. So this is a Check MK's website. This is the demo version, their live demo version that I have here. And you can see. Uh, You've got the critical 170 e emails incoming into inbox. So obviously he's got some sort of check sit sitting there. And all that check has done is returned this piece of text. The check MK is then saying, well, I see that text beginning with critical, so it's obviously a problem, and I'm raising it as an alert. <coughs> uh, you can also go in to the hosts and say, for instance, go to this one. And here you can see all the checks that it's done. And you can see all these ones are marked as OK. 
And again, the text is exactly as the, that script outputted, whether it be the, the standard check MK scripts or one that you've done yourself. Uh, you can also see that a lot of them have values. So in which case, it populates the graph. And you can see the same, all that information over time, which is very handy if you come back and say, okay, something's gone wrong. I can go back and see what time it actually went high CPU or whatever. Uh, you also have, uh, let's see, so here we've got one that's in critical, uh, et cetera. Let's see what this does. Ah, oh, shows your graphs. This is a new version, so I haven't seen this. But you've got, of course got other bits and pieces. If it sees a, an error in the log file, it comes up with a little icon that you can actually go in and see the log files remotely. And it doesn't just show you the error that occurred in the log file that caused the error. It shows you the error logs above and below, which is often very helpful for going back and seeing what happened just before you got the error. So it, it integrates very well into, into Nagios and makes the whole Nagios experience a lot better and easier to configure. Uh, the other thing I thought I'd talk about is Nagvis, which is another Nagios plugin. Let me open this file that I did, took a screenshot a little while ago. So all Nagvis does is it integrates these alerts to display on an image. So in this case, someone's taken a photo of the server racks, and you can see that they've configured the server racks to have these little uh, plus sim this little checkbox here. And that check, so the image is just static, it's whatever you choose it to be. And the checkbox you just place on that image, and that checkbox reflects an alert in Nagios. So in this case, I've moused over this particular alert, and you can see the output of that alert, and you can see that it's, uh, it tells you exactly these are all the things that belong to that, that uh, particular device. And you can see the first one here is red with high temperature. I think it says high temperature. Yeah, 127 degrees, which is not good. Yes. <laughs> we think it was actually a uh, faulty temperature sensor, but because obviously it's still working, 127 degrees Celsius, it probably wouldn't be working for too long. Yeah, that's probably someone else in the back. <laughs> no, I think he's probably taking a photo of the other side. This one is Nagvis, Nagvis, so it's Nagios visual, and it's just a static image, you, you just place whatever. What we actually have in our system is someone's actually drawn a complete uh, block diagram of all the processes and services, and the arrows joining those processes and services and appropriate ticks in the appropriate places. So when we have a link down from this process to that process, that link actually gets highlighted as red. So that means immediately you can see exactly what processes are involved, how they link together, which bits are working, which bits are not. Uh, but that's company stuff and proprietary stuff and I didn't really want to feel comfortable showing that sort of stuff here. So this one is much more basic and just shows you the, uh, the basic idea of it anyway. And so that's it. Any questions? Okay, should I use this computer? I was trying to work out. Can I can I just commandeer this computer here? Okay. Blah blah blah. Hello. Great. Just want to make sure that's okay. I'll just see if I can find it. I just wrote some notes. I haven't done any slides. I've just written a blog posting. 
That was the intro, was it? Oh, yes. You can write your own intro. I'm quite happy. <laughs> uh, okay. Let me just make the text a bit better. Okay. I'm Tom Worthington. Um, I do consulting things in Canberra. Um, what happened was a couple of weeks ago, I went to help out with um, an event, um, what's it called, TEDx Canberra. And the organisers said, now, I want everybody to download this app to their smartphone so we can register people as they arrive. And I went, I haven't got a smartphone. <laughs> and they all looked at me. So I rushed out and bought a smartphone. <laughs> Uh, so I thought, um, what will I buy? Uh, and I thought, well, I'm going to get me going overseas shortly, so it would be good to have one where I can put more than one SIM card in. So I picked, and then I noticed this one on sale. So I went and bought, uh, how do you pronounce it? Hawaii? Hawaii. $249. I think you were yawning. Who was yawning at the back? Yeah. OK. Yeah. So, $249 smartphone um, and um, the, the uh, party trick that the phone has is that you can come up and have a look later, I'll take the back off. Normally you have one slot in the back where you put the SIM card from your mobile phone carrier. This one has two slots and it has um, um, two separate radio transmitters, the 2G network, the 3G network and you can have two cards in there with two different mobile phone carriers simultaneously. And it works with the normal Android services. So it does all those things like it's got a web browser and it'll uh, act as a Wi-Fi hub or you can plug it in with a cable and all of that sort of thing. Um, very generic Google Android. They haven't added any extra interface over the top of the thing. Um, and it was, but the the interesting part was the complication in trying to figure out how to, to use the two cards. What I did was I put my 2G mobile phone card in for making phone calls and I put a Virgin broadband SIM card in because if you have a mobile phone and you want to use broadband data, they charge you lots of money compared to if you buy a broadband card for a broadband gadget. So I put one in each slot and I found you can configure the phone so that for making a phone call you use the phone card and for making a data access you use the broadband data sim um, at the same time. The only catch with this was the two uh, radio transmitters for two different carriers work simultaneously fine up until the point where you want to make a phone call at which case the broadband service cuts out, or if you use the broadband, the phone service cuts out. Uh, obviously, if you had two telephone line uh, cards in it and you want to make phone calls, you're not going to make two calls simultaneously. So the, the original I idea I had of having the, the data service separate to the voice didn't quite work out. So what if, if you were browsing the web, somebody rang and they cut off? Yes. Yes. So when you look at the phone, up the top of the screen it has two little signal indicators, one for each, um, both active simultaneously. If you get an SMS message, that doesn't matter. That works fine. Uh, but the problem is when you answer the phone and you look at the, the thing, the symbol or one has a red cross through it indicating yeah. that connection's no longer active. As soon as you hang up, it reactivates. Okay. Um, and you can tell it. I managed to tell it that I didn't want it to use the data service on the phone SIM card because that costs, I don't know what it is, 20 cents a kilobyte or something ridiculous on the plan I'm on. So I told it, don't use that SIM card. Use, and it works out that when I want to use the web browser on the phone, it'll use the data yeah. SIM card. A little complicated when you want to make phone calls because you you have to select which card to use. You can attempt to make a phone call on the broadband SIM card, in which case you get a recorded message mm -hmm. saying the service is not available. I don't know why they don't just configure it. Yeah, so there's no option. So you can't sort of say, um, like choose a collection of people in your contacts and say you would make a phone call using this SIM. 
it does do that. So if you use a, if you use the, make a phone call using one SIM, it remembers the next time you go to make a phone call. If you push the button, it'll use that SIM to make the phone call. Um, apart from that, it's a generic Android telephone. Sound quality is not very good. I wish someone would make a flip cover on it using one of these 3G, uh, what do you call it, 3D printing devices. But that was about all I wanted to say. You can read about it on the web. Lots of people in America are sending me queries um, asking, is the screen really 3.2 inches? Can you measure it, please? <laughs> uh, and the only details they have in America is that the FCC have the user manual on their website for when the technical approval was made. And that seems to be the only information. It looks like it's been released in China and Australia first. Um, it's... Uh, well, no, it's, it's progressive, but it's not common. <laughs> it's, and I have to confess, I've reverted to using my 2G telephone because until I can figure out how to use it properly, it's a bit of a nuisance. Uh, but it's one of those gadgets that come around. Okay. That was about all. Thank you. And you can see Margarita's e-book on it as well. Oh, can you? Now, that's not mine, so... No, that's right. All right, so uh, Tim is Tim. Patrick. Patrick has written on the board that this is James Explains. But just like last month, I'm doing James Declares and talking about another one of my favorite declarative languages. Yes, Jamie? I'm not streaming. I'm not streaming? That's a shame. This is not a Mac. <laughs> what? Uh, this doesn't do 12 8 by 2. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I should be able to do this. Do this. If I do that, apply. And then I somehow need to get my cursor up there and click on that. Great. Now my monitor's way up there and I can't see what I'm doing here. Does the display look okay? Yes. Okay, where's Chrome gone? Right, so last month I talked about a language called DOT, which is used for drawing uh, acyclic graphs or directed acyclic graphs. Um, the language I want to talk about this month is um, a language called... It's a language called Puppet, which is used by a tool called Puppet, um, which a lot of sysadmins use heavily. It's used to declare what state you want your server to be in, and then the tool Puppet looks at that declaration, compares it with reality, and goes through and just smashes it until it resembles what you've declared it should be. Um, so what I'm looking at here is the um, web page that shows you some of the resource types that you can declare in Puppet. Um, because it's a tool that's aimed at sysadmins, there's lots of uh, system things like you can declare a cron job and so the cron job should run this command it should run this time um, and puppet will take care of, care of figuring out on this system cron jobs de are defined in this location I need to do this to set it up uh, you can define things like Wee! Uh, files files are one of the really really basic things you can declare, you know, files should be at this location, should have this content, should have this mode. Um, you can declare packages. Packages are one of the standard, really powerful examples of what Puppet can do because it supports many different kinds of package managers on many different kind of uh, Unix and Unix-like systems. 
including OS X, and to st they're starting to get some support for Windows. So you can see here that you can say things like, I need Apache. And Puppet can figure out, OK, well, today I'm on AX. In order to get Apache on AX, I need to go to this repo and download these files and do these things. But on a completely different machine, it can say, well, actually, I'm on Red Hat, so I just need to do yum upgrade or up to date or you know, depending on what your platform is, it figures out what it needs to do. So my example to show you what you can do with Puppet is um, using a sledgehammer to crack a walnut. Um, completely unrelatedly, I started recently putting a lot of my standard config files into a Git repo, which you can't really see on that, um, because I got tired of like, setting up Vim again on every single machine. So I have this repo. It does stuff. So it has my, my, all my Vim configs in here. When I'm on a new machine, I can just use Git to clone this into my home door, and voila, I've got my usual environment. But it has a few weaknesses. For instance, um, I have a standard SSH config that I use on most machines. And unfortunately, Git is designed for a very specific purpose, which does not involve keeping track of the permissions of files. So it tends to, um, as you can see here, I've tried to SSH. SSH is not happy because my SSH config file is rather too broad and pointing off to my Dropbox. That is completely wrong. But anyway, that'll do. The point is, permissions are wrong. So instead of having to, every time I do a Git checkout on a new machine, I can simply tell Puppet to go ahead and fix things for me. Uh, let me get rid of that because it's annoying. That's better. So you can see here I've started uh, a Puppet config file where I'm declaring a couple of files. Um, all I have to do is give it the file name, tell it uh, to ensure the file is present. You can see here I've got one file where I'm specifying the content of the file. Um, so that's this line here, because this is my public key. I'd like this public key to be in lots of places. Obviously, I'm not going to put my private key in a Git repo and share it with the world. And um, But you can see I'm also declaring, telling it to look after the directory. Now, if I run this file in no-op mode, uh, that's not going to work. Puppet will come back and tell me what it's detected that's different. So you can see there, if I let Puppet go ahead, it's going to change permissions on uh, tilde.ssh, and it's going to create uh, .idrsa.pub uh, for me. But the thing I want it to do is change permissions on my ssh config file. And if you give me a second, I will copy. No, they're not. So to add this file, I just need to declare that I want a Puppet to manage a new file. It's called home shasper.ssh slash config. I want Puppet to ensure that it's present, which is a bit meaningless when I'm not telling Puppet where it should pull the file from. Um, normally, you would at this point either give it the content of the file or tell it where to find the file or give it a Ruby template that it can run. But I want its mode to be 0600. So I'll test my changes. Um, I think it will not. I don't know. I've never actually done anything without an control line. Um, you can. <laughs> If you want to make sure a file's not present, you can use ensure absent, and it will delete that file if it's present. Um, normally, you'd be pointing it at a source of the file. 
and say, make sure this file exists and looks like this. So if I run this again, you'll see that it's now going to complain about, it's going to say that there's a syntax error. Fantastic. Where is my syntax error? Right there. Great, so that looks like it's doing what I want. So I'm gonna get rid of the no-op. And just for fun, I'm gonna replace it with graph. So this time you'll see that Puppet's actually going ahead, tells me that it's actually changed modes. If I look at .ssh, see that it's actually done what it said it was going through, which is not very surprising. But if you look inside Uh, this magic place that I looked at earlier. I have a dot file. Uh, so you can see that uh, Puppet's generated this very nice little dot file. Now, you could read it, read the text to see what it means, but it's kind of annoying. So Let me just use the dot tool. Yeah, it would be nice. Come over here. Oops. Uh, open up this PNG. Uh, there we go. You can see Puppin's drawn a nice little diagram of the dependencies. Of, the, of what it's just created. You can see that although I only defined a directory and two files inside that directory, Puppet is smart enough to go, well, obviously you can't create those files if the directory doesn't exist. And so it set up some implicit relationships there. And that's all I've declared in my config, so you can see that there's not much else there. Um, but if, you, if you're managing multiple machines and you need to keep them in a known consistent state, Puppet is the tool to use. Um, docs.puppetlabs.com is where the docs are, and they have some good tutorials to walk through. If you want professional training, they come around every couple of months and they charge you out two and a half grand for a couple of days of training, but there's lots of docs you can read instead. I'm done. Questions? Yeah? Um, I used, it depends which version of Puppet you're using as to how you do that. I think I've got a nasty old version, um, .25. So the command in that case is you just use Puppet and then give it the name of a .pp. Um, on the newer versions, anything 2.6 and above, you, I think it's Puppet apply and the name of the file. Um, as Rob said, it is a nasty hack. Puppet is designed to have a server called Puppet Master that it talks to, and um, it's meant to, so that all your machines across your network talk to, back to the one Puppet Master and get the same set of configs. Um, using it like this is a really, really nasty hack. Um, you should really only do this for testing or, you know. Presentation. A presentation, yeah. It's good for a quick demo. Excellent. Your power supply is that? Uh, no, it's a power supply. Oh, they just supply power so supplies. Yeah. Red on the blue one. Well, I think the fact that you don't remember tells us a lot. That's it. There's lots of things in movies to remember. It's interesting. That film is painted and gone. Lord of the Rings is painted and gone, but I know the apes are still there. Okay. <laughs> 
Sorry, I'm the factory cutter. All right. For, <laughs> for those who haven't been here for the last three, the previous two months, I've um, I, I've given two two other talks about writing and formatting the book, in which was in July, um, and then in August there was an issue about interoperability, and then this talk is I finally got the finished products. So I actually published the ebook first, um, and it's this is all self-published through Lulu Vanity Press stuff, and Lulu, you you have to format your ebook into an EPUB format and you have to put it through the, all this validation stuff till you get it exactly right or you can pay Lulu to do it. So I actually struggled and did it. Um, so that was published July, um, just before the July meeting um, and then I thought well you've now got the HTML files, you need to produce the printed a PDF to upload to Lulu to produce this what's the paperback. And so, <laughs> and that's one of these things which has text on it. <laughs> um, and and but one of the things was there was a few things you had to jig um, in 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 um, taking the HTML. But what I actually used was Open Office, so I imported the HTML files into a master document. And last w and last week we had a last month we had a big. LaTeX campaign saying, why did you do it in LaTeX? Um, but as far as I know, I don't think LaTeX takes the HTML files, so because I already had my source in HTML. So the idea was to try and maintain the source material. And then today, um, I'm just going to say that now everything, now it's done. So I'm in the sort of um, selling area. Um, so the ebook is is um, through Lulu. You just once you've uploaded it, it um, makes it available um, on uh, through Lulu as an EPUB format, or um, it then uploads it to whatever the uh, wherever you get iTunes from, and it's available as an iTunes. And then I've got the paperback, um, which was from the PDF. Um, one of the things that came up. Between the ebook and the paperback was with the with the ebook. I had this sort of feeling that people would be able to click through. I guess because I always thought it would be like the web, and so I put less material in there with more links. Then when I came to do the paperback, I thought, well, one of the things was there's a whole lot of issues about using of images. When when I asked people, can I use it on the ebook? They, they, a lot of people said, yeah, that's fine, go ahead. Then when I said, can I use it in the paperback, they were different views. They, were, they really wanted to sell you a copy. So that was an interesting perception people have of, of the two copies. So mainly aimed at the paperback. Can I, can I ask, what, can they articulate the differences they perceive? I mean, like an e-book, people could see it, and they could more easily copy the image. Well, it's 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 quite an odd thing, and I think I'm doing a t talk at. Um, I'm not sure if I'm doing a talk, but it, in 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 the book, what we're talking about is all. This is about 1890s Annandale. So all the images I want. I mean, it's the it it end up having a lot of my images, but one of the things is in the ebook, I actually used an 1894 picture of the of a street from the local library. And they said, yeah, fine, put it in your ebook." But when I came to say, can I use it in the paperback, they said, oh no, that'll cost you 40 bucks. <laughs> and I said, but it's, a, it's the same image. Um, and they said, oh no, this is our policy when you're publishing a book. So obviously they don't think an ebook's really a book. And then I said to someone else, oh, but I'm just gonna use your thing from the web. Because in fact, they can't charge you a copyright fee because the photographs are out of copyright. So what they're doing is charging you a service fee for the high quality image. And in fact, one lot had the images on the website. I said, I'm using one lot. I said, look, it's only a little book. I don't need a super high resolution image. And they said, oh no, we don't permit you to use low resolution images. I said, well, it's going to be low resolution by the time it comes out of here. Anyway, so 
you, you work through all of that. So in fact, I've just looked at the ebook again on, whoop, whoop. My new phone. Oh, <laughs> it's still working, it's still working. That's right, one of the cities still works. <laughs> okay. That's why you got two. <laughs> now, can you get the EPUB that we looked at before? One, so. Wave the phone around. All right. So. <laughs> no, <I'm not. laughs> Now, I've just looked at the e-book on here, and it, it, it does the page thing, which I'm told that's how you can move page. You click through pages, which I actually thought would bug you, Chris, <laughs> just for some things. But what doesn't seem to be working is the hyperlinks. I, or, I don't know if they're too small for my fingers, but that's one of the tricks on that side screen. But it's, it is quite readable. Is this the uh, e or the video? Sorry? That's the EPUB format, which we'll look at, which is there. So that that's using whatever. Is that is that Google? That's um, what's it called? Or Calibre. Calibre. So so this is what I envisage the ebook to look like and to work, and so you get the content. Are you going to work it for me? <laughs> and we and so I, I went through great effort to make hyperlinks to within the the book. And as far as I can see on this thing, those hyperlinks are not working. So you can. Um, if you hover over it now on that on the laptop, nothing. Oh, okay. What yeah, happens no, when you click on that? That works. And presumably some of them are actually going to go out to my website, yeah. which is free information. But it's more information <laughs> because one of the things about writing a book versus being out there is it's a bit like a lecture, I guess. So. Um, so the e-book has a lot of those things, but when it came to printing the paperback, I thought people would like the photos. Um, and so I actually ended up getting a web, in the puppy seats, please. A web page with all the links. Um, so I think, oh, I might just mention, okay, so, so, that, so basically that's the e-book. Um, there Can I go and back to the web page. No, um, is that the ebook? Yes. I was just going to show the one thing. This is the photograph, which is in fact the 1894 election, which they said was fine to put in the ebook, but they wanted to be paid if I wanted a co the same. In so the they image. took high definition photos in those days, did they? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And they digitise it. Oh, I think mean, that's impressive technology. I was just catching up there. Yeah, so, so, so what I actually had was that picture there, and then, um, oh no, I don't actually know how to, how do I go to the next page in this, um, oh, okay, and that's, that's the same image, so the Primitive Methodist Church is gone, and the, but the two houses on either side are still there, so, um, so that, that was something cute that I could put in the e-book, but it's not in here, you have to click through because, uh, in here, it's one of the um, things listed. Yep. Yeah? When you've tried to link through from the EPUB version, have you tried it on anything other than that phone? I mean, you've tried, it works here. Yeah, it works. Yeah. So I'm, so I'm wondering if you've tried it on an other phone to see if it works on another phone. No. I mean, I'm not sure whether it's the um, the ebook reader that's not because there's a browser on that phone because that's I take it. Um, so so that's that's just one of the issues. It's working now. Oh, okay. So I there you go. I downloaded two different ebook readers. One okay. didn't work. It looks like the other one does work. Which one worked? Uh, FB reader. Okay, um, so that's one of the things. One of the last bits I might actually also mention is when you actually do publish a book, I, and again, it's only the printed book, <laughs> you're supposed to lodge a legal deposit, and in, and in New South Wales, that's a copy to the National Library, a copy to the Sydney University Library, a copy to the State Library, and a copy to the Parliamentary Library. So... Off, off, off the, yeah, that's right. 
Apparently that's to conserve the heritage of New South Wales. Did they accept the electronic copy? No, I don't think they do. Um, <laughs> well, they don't care, so I guess you don't contribute to the heritage of New South Wales if you do own the e-book. Because they didn't, because, I mean, the e-book's there, and it's actually a sl it's slightly different thing. But um, they didn't seem to be the issue, but with this, I, I think you are supposed to. Uh, and it's actually printed matter still, so the, I guess that law hasn't changed. But... I think Tom reckons Lulu sends it to the co you, um, Congress in the US. Now, I was actually just going to give a plug for um, the digital culture public sphere thing that is being run on the, on the 6th of October um, at the state, state um, I think it's the Teachers Union um, by Kate Lundy and Simon Crean and I think, and I mean I've raised the issues about the copyright because this, the National Library was very good they said yeah go for it, use whatever you like if you want the high quality version let us know but I didn't try the State Library but all the different organisations were different, had different opinions I mean I think the way the, the National Library looked at it, it was like an advertisement and they got credit and they were happy with that. And in fact, they, there are grants where if you want to go and use their material, they'll pay you to publish books. So they, as, I think as far as they were concerned, this came for free. Um, so, so that's actually on this week if anyone's interested in the area of, of digital media and stuff. That link is correct to um, the Kate Lundy um, public sphere, though the date is wrong. It's, it's in fact the 6th. I'm, I'm doing a book launch on the 8th, that's why I got confused. Um, and what else was there? Um, yep, that's all. And I was actually just going to show you another walk, which if people are interested in, in walks. This is one where the State Library released all their images um, in, under Creative Commons. So I integrated them into this walk. So there's a Google walk and this is a walk from Annandale to Circular Quay and I put the historic images there along the way so you can... This is an Android app? Well David and I were just discussing how 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 you actually w would do a walk on an e-book because it's really more integrated into the map because when I gave th this the, in the e-book there isn't a map because I didn't think there was much point putting a map in because people would have... Well, I kind of assumed falsely... Random. Hey? Carried a random phone. What's that? Around. Well, yeah, and it can talk to you even. So you can listen to it, possibly. But, um, but when I gave this to my target audience, the first thing she said was, you need a map. So I've, put it, I've drawn a little map and put that in there. But um, how it'll work... I mean, normal, I've done quite a few walking maps which are available on Google and that's, those are free. I mean, how they work, and, and when you actually click on, you click on these, so you can be in the map and you click on this and it'll come up and it should tell you a bit about what each spot is. Yeah, that, that, well, uh, that, that, I mean, seriously. <laughs> anyway, seriously, I think that that's, that's in fact the next, uh, next sort of little thing because it, I think doing e-books of walks is really not the future. Um, so that's it. Did you think I said it's map when I said it's app? Ah, did you say no, it's app? I don't imagine, like, I like one of those virtual brands like Leia where you have all those photographs and as you walk around, you turn the, you turn the phone using the camera yes. and it actually overlays that image from where you're standing and look at it as it used to be. No, I'm not volunteering anything. No, no, <laughs> but, but sorry, but that is, but it, that is what I'm talking about. I might, be oh, calling okay. it, I might be calling it a map, but what you want to know is when you get to this point, 
and you look at the building. Yes. It might be a photograph, but you'd also want to know the text of what's right. happened. So, in fact, that's what this book does. It's, I mean, I've got a photograph and it says, oh, um, this was a convent run by Mary McKillop. Right. So, yeah. that's the kind of stuff that's in here. So, I think that's it. Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Who's next? Thanks. Do you want this? All right. Um, oh, well, I'm going to have to get your book now, aren't I? <laughs> Do I get right. it signed? If I get one, will you sign it? <laughs> no, really. If I get one, will you sign it? Digitally. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter is, my eldest is really into signed books, you know, and, and I'd like to get one of those just so we can go for a, we can all go for a walk around the world. And, well, but, but I can buy one, can't I? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Oh, look at that. It remembered me. Next month, <laughs> next month I'm going to give a talk on Linux and gaming. Uh, not because I do, just because I'm quite curious at the moment. Oh no, this is far too narrow. Hang on a second. Let me go back. Can I? Uh, yeah. Whose machine am I playing with? Yours. It's just I want to see down the archives on the right-hand side, but I can't. I just want to see August and July. I'm having trouble navigating here. Oh, not too small. I want to be able to read it. Oh, there we go. Ah, oh, that's good enough up there. Wacko. I'll do this in uh, reverse order. No. As I said, I don't, I don't actually play games much at all anymore, unfortunately. But um, I found this interesting little article about a company that was putting its own games on Pirate Bay. What they did was they modified the game slightly so that all the characters had pirate hats on. And they took some things out and added extra bits in so that you'd get a flavour of the game and an idea of it and be able to play almost the entire game, but with all the characters with pirate hats on. And some of the language changed, so they were going, Arr. <laughs> so you could download it illegally, after a fashion. <laughs> and what they found was that it increased their sales because people liked playing it so much and appreciated the fact that they could get it for free. They decided to buy it and get the extra bits on the original game. Which is pretty impressive when you think about it. And their argument was that, um, I mean, obviously somebody, probably Sony's going to send out a notice now to have it taken down, I suppose. Not that they own it, but has that ever stopped them? Doesn't appear to be. So there's a really interesting interview on Torrent Freak, uh, which is uh, through the link, which won't take you to, where they were talking about the motivation. They suddenly thought that, well, we've got this game, we've put it for sale, somebody's going to take this game and put it on some BitTorrent site somewhere. So why don't we do it first? And they actually have people writing to them saying, look, uh, it was pretty funny and, uh, you know, like, I'm going to buy it now, eh? Which is great for them. I'll give you a little bit of a view of this game because it's um, one of those, I oh, don't know what you really call it, scrolling. Was it platform? That's it. Ooh, move the hand out of the way. I don't think we've got sound, so. But the music's pretty good. And you can also download the album for the game. We can have sound if you want. Oh, can we? Okay. Oh, I didn't know it wasn't on. Oh. No. Yes, there is sound. Okay, you get an idea ready? It goes. Oh, lost the picture. Where's the. Pew, pew! That's the, the sort of stuff that we're missing. missing. And there's background. There's background noise. Okay. Oh, look at this. It's turned off on the little YouTube. Right there. You want to plug this in too? Oh, what's that? It's an audio camera. <laughs> Gonna make it through the speakers. <laughs> See this? Just there? Yeah. Okay. Click on that, push it up. And now we plug in the other cable. Oh, there we go. Now I can hear it. And maybe you can Where's your audio it. plug? It's called No Time to Explain. And it's almost over. But it's a really cute game. It's quite funny. I I'm 
gmail.com. Oh, 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 oh my god! Oh. You get an idea of the sort of sound that you get, but they actually released the album, which I found quite interesting. In itself, I mean, I'm not too sure if you want to listen to that all the time, but who knows? If you're 12, if you're 12, you probably do want to listen to that all the time. Are you looking for something? Who are you ringing? I just want to find out. Oh, good man. Oh no, sorry, wrong place. Completely unrelated. Now this one tells us everything that we knew anyway. The US military, particularly the Air Force, likes to have its employees elsewhere other than in the main building, so it's provided them with a live CD to access their workplace and browse the web and do the other things that people who work for the military do when they're at home. They invade Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, anybody like that, plan all sorts of things and do your banking at the same time. Pretty impressive. <laughs> this is... <laughs> It's quite interesting. It looks like Windows 95, which is a bit disturbing, really. So what they've done is they've created a Linux live CD and they, they give it to their staff and they provide it free to the public because it's used... In America, they have quite a lot of laws about things created by government agencies becoming public property and therefore must be released, like photographs, you know, must be released to the public for free, etc., etc., as we should have more here. So... Sorry? Do they? Where do they hide them? <laughs> they have loads of them, do they? So you can see it, like I said, it, it looks a little bit, bit like Windows 95. And they're promoting it as a way of their staff, but it's got this on the bottom. It still has a start button. And they're, they're saying to you, you know, whack it in your machine, do whatever you need to do. It also has a link directly to your office. Then obviously you need a password and off you go. This gives you a bit of an idea of what it looks like overall with their nice little logos on the side. But they're, so, they're heavily promoting this to staff as uh, the means by which they would do working, uh, what's the word, working remotely, that's it, working from home. And when I was reading it, they were making such a, you can look at it yourself, LPS, uh, at the ATSPI, anti something or other, whoever, whatever, the American, it was one of those instances where the American acronyms just, just don't work. Sorry, they acronyms rather, not acronyms. The acronym, they just don't have a good one for it. That's P. So I, I found it interesting that they're suddenly coming to the, the idea, and I thought, well, you could actually burn some of these and give them to your friends and say, look, this is what the American military do. <laughs> they don't use Windows <laughs> when you're not home. Maybe you shouldn't either. It's only seven years after not. That's right, yes. <laughs> And um, I was going to give a link to uh, Mac Puppy. Mac Puppy Linux, which is quite good. DSL, damn small so Linux, is gone. Oh, um, ooh, I'll, show, I'll go back up, actually. They had very, very few. Yeah, the encryption wizard, Xterm. Um, the most current Firefox, they release a different version every three months. So the most current Firefox, Flash, was on it. And then a whole, yes, and then a whole collection. What they're suggesting to the staff, what they're suggesting to staff is, if you're browsing the web and looking at things, and then you want to start working, turn the machine off, reboot the machine, go to work. As soon as you want to look at anything else, if you want to use your bank, turn the machine off, reboot the machine, start doing your work. Running it's just from the live CD. It's not meant to be installed. Which you know, apart from the turning off your machine and restarting it again, it reminds me of Windows. It. Um, because you know it doesn't work until you turn it off and restart it. But they haven't put any um, games. Open, op open office or anything. No, not that I was. I think no, no, I didn't notice no, that. I think you're meant to log into work and use it oh, remotely. Okay. Yeah, but I won't swear to that because I didn't look for it. I didn't look for a text editor. I was just more curious about it. Yes, yes. I like the start button with a penguin next to it. I. You know, you know what the term dissonance means? You, you notice or see two things which don't merge together? I looked at that and wasn't quite sure which hemisphere of my brain was looking at which. That's right. Dissonance. You, you know, dissonance occurs when two things which are more things appear to converge and you don't quite, and you, fi you find yourself experiencing physical as well as psychological difficulty. So it makes you feel queasy or makes you feel 
unwell. Um, like if you were, if you were a um, fundamentalist Christian and saw two girls kissing. There you go, that'd be physical dissonance for somebody as well as a psychological dissonance for them. We are straying from the topic. Last one. This is one of my favourites. I saw this just recently. This is an example of somebody who decides that they're going to make lots of their own applications just because they can. And I, I wrote to him, Mike Korn. Uh, he's a very interesting guy. He's created a number of, of uh, applications which was released under a Creative Commons licence. Didn't think to ask him why at the time. The first one was this one, Photox. Which reminds me of something else. Um, which none of the graphics to the applications have some of the sort of uh, nice fancy elements to them that others do, but it is blisteringly fast. This, once it's scanned your media for, um, for photos, is supremely quick at looking and, and uh, presenting uh, your photos to you. I was really impressed by the speed for this. But what it can do though is a whole collection of other things as well. There's a huge collection of various editing um, uh, possibilities that exist. You know, composites, panoramas, smart arrays. As people remember resynthesize. I gave a presentation some months ago about resynthesizing GIMP. Smart arrays is the same thing. You can choose an area that you no longer wish to be in the photograph, um, cut around that area, set resynthesize, and it will actually then create, an, a, it will then remove that image and create another image for it from your background. And if you do that a couple of times, you can then create a huge landscape that didn't have that big wind turbine that was going in the, at the time. Um, calibrated color adjustments, artful transforms, I like that one. Uh, retouches, uh, red eye and things like that. And I'll give you a couple of examples of what he's done. So cloning, which was quite simple to do. Noise reduction. So if you have a, if you can see, I can't actually tell if you guys can see very clearly there. You can see better on the original, but the, um, it denoises the image and it actually does the example he's given there is a really good example of how a grainy photo can be denoised so it actually looks a lot nicer, a lot smoother um, and not as, not as grainy. Um, this is a really good example, scanned a picture out of a book and of course the, as you can see, the paper itself, um, the denoising has actually removed a lot of that. Slight, as you can tell, a denoising will always make an image slightly, it will make it not as sharp but still you get a, you know, a pretty good photo out of it compared to the previous one. And this one's a good example for those people who aren't sure what resynthesize or um, smart uh, removal is. These are the original lines, power lines, that no longer exist. You can do that in, with cloning, but um, resynthesizing is so much easier, it's quicker. And, uh, and this actually seems to work uh, very quickly as well. So you can clone a background uh, and get rid of some images, but this works far, far more efficiently. And this is a fantastic example here of removing dirt uh, from a really bad scan that somebody's got. You can see the significant difference in the image quality, getting rid of all that noise. Now the last thing, one of the other ones that I downloaded that I liked of his was it called Galaxy. And um, it's a way of representing the effect of gravity on st um, uh, celestial bodies. So in other words, what you would do is, as you can see at the top here, it says God mode. <laughs> you click on God, you tell it how many planets you want, the strength of the gravity, whether you want a black hole or not, and how strong the black hole would be in, in this, um, this area of space. And then you set it running, and you can see all the planets, the various gravitational effects as the planets start to move towards each other and get thrown back off and out and then come back again and you can see all these this, these uh, patterns start to emerge of planets. Uh, well, it, celestial bodies, there you go. <laughs> it could be a star. And um, this is an example of running it with 16,000 celestial bodies and um, uh, running it for an hour. And it reminds me of something. <laughs> Strangely enough, it makes you wonder how ours got to look like that in the first place. Um, so it's a really good way of, particularly I find it fascinating just sitting there watching it, but it's a really good way of showing other people who don't really grasp the notion of gravity on a massive scale about how, it can actually, how you can actually create a galaxy from 
things that just happen to be out there that have their own gravity. Um, that's my presentation, unless anybody has any questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, up the back. Sorry? Behind me. <laughs> oh, there we go. There's a, I see you were saying there's a question, right, James? Well, I know all my children's teachers, but none of them are in high school. Probably, I know three. Why? Oh, I see, right, yeah. Oh, yeah, look, look, I think those sorts of applications, uh, like a Celestia, which is absolutely stunningly fantastic. I love Celestia, like K-Stars. Has anybody seen these? Maybe I should just, just do one on those. Yeah, does everybody know what K-Stars is? It's a KDE application that... Um, uh, we'll show you where any celestial body in our galaxy is at the moment and you can click on that and it will give you a link to the Wikipedia page, the uh, NASA JPL page that relates to it. Um, it doesn't give you a, cl a close-up of those bodies but you can, it will give you a whole collection of links through to various websites that have information about them. And you can take, literally, you can take your laptop out into the, into the night with you, obviously not your desktop, you take your laptop out Make sure you set up the direction correctly and the time, and then you can see exactly what's in the sky above you if you're not in Sydney and have really bad cloud coverage. But if you were somewhere where you could see... You should have come last week. Last month, there was the fantastic video with the alignment. Ah, right, yeah, yeah, that's right, yes. Right over the That's right, yeah, exactly, exactly. So K-Stars is, is really but good for things like that. <laughs> yes, no, there is a nap for that. A, an Android app, which will let you do that. So k is really good. I'll have to do something on school. Who's got school children? Nobody. <laughs> really, nobody. Jeez, I don't know whether I feel old or young. Sorry? We wouldn't be here. <laughs> well, I'm trying to work out whether it makes me old or young. I've got no idea yet. Or normal. Or normal. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Um, and oh, thank next up <laughs> is John with an... Ethics talk stuff. Okay, so Patrick, how much time do I have for? Um, it is now. Don't need a computer. Two. No, I don't need a computer. This is a, a an actual talk without. You want it half an hour? Didn't you? Yeah, half an hour. All right. All right. All right. Well, we have actually have a break for five minutes. Yes. All right. A five-minute break sounds good. <laughs> 